My name is Hannah Berger. Today we're here to talk about supercharging your fundraising board. Um, as Katie shared, I do have 20 years of experience in the nonprofit sector in the US. I've actually done a little bit of international philanthropy as well. Uh, I've worked on both sides of the coin, meaning I've done corporate philanthropy, but I've spent most of my career as a nonprofit fundraiser. 10 of those years building up incredibly successful fundraising teams for community-based organizations. So I share all of that because I want you to know that as a development staff member, as a chief development officer, as a consultant now and a coach, I have likely experienced the challenges that you're going through. So know that the advice I give today and the case studies that I might share to support the material I'm going to present, um, it comes from lived experience, right? Uh, I've walked in your shoes. So we're in this together. Um, as Katie shared, I am a lead instructor for the Fundraising Academy, uh, which is an awesome um, organization born out of National University. And the Fundraising Academy provides education and training to nonprofit fundraisers throughout the US and beyond. We do that through online and in-person workshops. Um, and we are focused on helping emerging fundraisers deepen relationships through what we call our cause selling approach, which I'll share a little bit more about in just a moment. But real quick, I want to do a poll first. Tell us about yourself. Um, how many years of individual giving experience do you have? So there are your options. Give it just a moment to get some responses in. This is great. I lost count of how many years. Okay, wonderful. Okay, we've got a nice little variety here of, of folks and their experience levels. That's fantastic. Um, so what I want to encourage is those of you who have been doing this a long time like me, feel free to drop your wisdom into the chat as well as I'm going through these materials. This is great. Thank you so much. And then I have one more question for everyone. How big is your board currently? So are you on the smaller side where you're managing up one to five people? Do you have six to 10? A few folks have very large boards. It's great. That means lots of opportunity for engagement, right? Okay, very good. So it looks like we're, we're averaging at around 10. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, again, as I walk through this, please be sure to put your questions and comments in the chat. Katie's gonna help us out with monitoring that and then lining up questions for me when we get to the Q&A portion. So our objectives for today, we're gonna to go over three key things. What makes for a strong board, right? There are best practices out there. There are some sort of rules to how we do this. So we're gonna review those to make sure we're on the same page. We're gonna talk a, a fair amount about how to establish expectations from the beginning. I feel that that's really the key to success ultimately with our volunteer leaders. And then we're gonna review a few different techniques for board engagement and fundraising and hopefully send you away with some new ideas about um, how you can get your board really excited and more involved in your fundraising efforts. So in the chat, um, please share at least one thing that you currently do to involve your board members in fundraising. That might be something as simple as writing thank you notes or placing phone calls to donors. Perhaps they're helping you identify new folks. Chris says we have them chair committees, okay? Writing personal notes on event invitations. Mandatory expectation to be involved in prospecting for fundraising. I love that, Beth. Sharing LinkedIn posts, that's a super easy ask. Very good. Try to get them to identify new donors. We will definitely touch on that. Kathy's got a brand new board. Great, so you're in the right place, Kathy. We're gonna send you home with lots of tips. Signature events, wonderful. Try to get them involved on social media. Very good, giving them some tools that are easy to promote. Okay, great. So you're already doing some really good tactical things with your board members. 
I want you to hold on to these questions that you shared with all of us today because what we're going to do is come back at the end and add on to that. And hopefully you'll walk away with at least a couple of action items that you can put into practice in the coming weeks and months, okay? So the cause selling cycle. If you ever take another workshop with the Fundraising Academy, you will see this again. Um, we break what uh, we call this eight step cause selling cycle down into three key phases, right? This is all about how we identify, approach, engage our prospective donors and how we build this really beautiful relationship that is in the circular, circular cycle. Um, because once we get to that stewardship phase, we want these people to help us then prospect, right? And we do this with our boards. So this eight step cycle, I may refer to it later in the presentation. Just know that it's sort of the basis for everything we do at Fundraising Academy. And it's um, a really helpful tool that not only is um, really efficient in developing your relationships with your donors, but teaching your board how to do the same thing. Donita says it's all about relationships. Absolutely, yes, yes. Okay, so it all starts with recruitment, right? I talk to clients a lot who say, my board just doesn't want to fundraise. I can't get them active. It's like pulling teeth all of the different complaints, right? And I will ask them, when you were recruiting them to the board, what did you tell them about fundraising and the expectations around that? And typically speaking, there's a real gap there in how we're communicating when we're recruiting for new board members, right? Some executive directors and founders, especially early stage sort of startup nonprofits, they're just needing warm bodies, right? And that approach nine times out of 10 will result in fundraising pain later on. So we wanna make sure going in, and even if we're more seasoned and we have a more mature organization, when we are first starting those recruitment conversations, we want to have the discussion about fundraising and the board members role in that way before they accept a seat on your board, right? So in order to do that, we need to have a few tools in place. Um, roles and responsibilities, a really clear position description. What is bo board membership? What is it not, right? Just like a job description that you would write for any position in your organization, you wanna have one for your board of directors. Literally a, a document, I was going to say a piece of paper, but a digital document that you can email to them for them to review, ask questions about, uh, and then have as a reference point later once they are already serving on your board, okay? Diversity, equity, and inclusion. If your organization doesn't already have a policy, you should. Um, that is a board decision to make, of course, with the guidance, leadership, and partnership of your executive team. Um, but you wanna make sure that, especially if you are serving communities of color, that you have a representative board of directors, right? Uh, lived experience is just as important, if not more important, to personal capacity or incredible networks of wealth, right? So we wanna make sure that we are keeping an eye on that and ensuring that we have that as part of the fundraising conversation with our board early on. A code of ethics, um, ensuring that folks understand what is okay and what is not. Katie mentioned the podcast that I um, was a guest on, I believe it was early last month where we talked about making sure your organization doesn't end up in a Netflix docu-series. It's very, very real. We wanna make sure that our board members understand what good board service looks like and what is not okay. Secession planning is um, not just about supporting staff secession, but also board secession, right? Hopefully your board does have terms. It's great if they're renewable, right? but some organizations can end up getting stagnant because their volunteer leadership gets stagnant. And we wanna ensure that we're always cycling through new leadership that's bringing fresh perspectives, fresh networks. Um, so we wanna make sure we have a secession plan in place, which would also include part of your onboarding process, right? New board members need guidance, perhaps pairing them with a seasoned board member and a newbie, right? Board buddies, I like to call it. Then there's built-in mentorship, right? That's part of your succession plan. And lastly, prospecting practices. So a lot of folks in the chat mentioned, you know, um, we ask our boards to make introductions. Um, I think I was 
if I was reading between the lines correctly, I was seeing a little bit of frustration around that. Perhaps board members are hesitating about opening up their networks and making introductions. We want to be sure that when we are uh, recruiting our board members, we talk about that right up front, just like there's a responsibility around perhaps giving a donation. There's a responsibility around opening your networks, making introductions, being a great ambassador, bringing lots and lots of folks to our development team or executive director so that the staff can then help qualify and I think I froze for a second there. Are we okay? Okay, I'm going to continue on. Back on. Thank you. <laughs> so briefly, I want to make sure we all know about these 10 board responsibilities. Um, if you're not familiar with board source, that's board, S-O-U-R-C-E dot org. Um, make sure you get familiar with it. This is an organization that exists to support good board governance, nonprofit board governance. And these 10 responsibilities come right out of their best practice guides. Okay. So your board is responsible for determining the mission and the purpose of the organization, right? That mission can change over time and they're there to um, be the somewhat objective body to help make these decisions, right? They select the chief executive. So they put that CEO or executive director in place. They also evaluate their performance. They are expected to ensure effective planning. So that strategic plan, while the staff should absolutely have a major role in it, your board also needs to be a, a huge driving force behind it, okay? Your board is expected to monitor and strengthen programs and services. So that means um, not only do they need to make sure that there's enough uh, resources in place to support programs and services, but that they are actually effective programs and services. Um, they're expected to ensure legal and ethical integrity. That's a big one. They are legally responsible for the things that happen in the organization. Um, of course, they're, they're expected to enhance the organization's public standing. So that's being great ambassadors, making introductions, um, talking about the organization in a really beautiful light out in public. Um, they are expected to build a competent board. So recruitment isn't just a staff activity, right? It's a partnership between the existing board of directors and the staff. They need to, number nine, my favorite, ensure adequate financial resources. Fundraising is an, a legal ethical expectation of good nonprofit board governance. It's built right in there. And then 10, they protect those assets that they help to ensure are brought in, right? They provide oversight um, of all of the financial policies, investments, bank accounts, etc. Okay. So what do our board members need when they have all from us? when they have all that tremendous responsibility on their shoulders. A few things are really important. They need to feel valued. Hopefully that's done in a number of ways, right? Um, you can't say thank you enough, of course, but folks also need support to feel valued, right? To know that you are their partner and that they can lean on you when they have questions, right? I say to my clients all the time, just because someone has personal wealth, a really successful career, um, a great network of people. Uh, maybe they're a real mover and shaker in your community. And that's why you've recruited them to their board. Just because they have all of those things doesn't make them an expert at nonprofit fundraising, right? They need your wisdom. They need your lived experience and they need your partnership. So board, the board itself needs good governance, right? That's why we have a structure where we have a board chair who oversees the other folks and provides mentorship and leadership there, right? Because they have to ensure that there's good governance at the highest level. They need to stay connected to the mission. How do we do that? Um, a big, you know, big piece of that puzzle falls to the staff. Volunteer opportunities, reporting back to the board about the great work that we're doing right? The direct service that's happening, the good and the bad, right? We need to make sure that they're aware of um, if we are fulfilling our mission or if there are additional steps, resources, programs, uh, things that we need to, them to get invested in to make sure that we are staying connected and on track. 
Okay, the board members need mentoring and support. I can't say that enough. Um, I always recommend when folks are looking at sort of uh, revamping their board structure or their board onboarding program that you do a two-fold board buddy system, a staff buddy and a board buddy, right? So that new board member comes on and in their onboarding process, they're assigned a point of contact on the staff and a point of contact on the board of directors. Hopefully it's a very seasoned board member who can, this way they've got two people they can go to with the stupid questions, right? Two partners that they feel like have their back no matter what, and that way they've got all the support they need. Board members need to have ownership. So what does that mean? That means going to a board meeting and just talking at them, reporting out is not going to result in a very excited, enthusiastic team, right? They need to feel like they've got skin in the game. Like you're not just asking them to make decisions, but you're having conversations with them that are strategic and intentional and meaningful and gives them a sense of ownership and pride over what they're helping to execute, whether that be a fundraising campaign or a major program initiative, okay? And then they need training. As I said before, just because they're successful in what they do doesn't mean they know anything about nonprofit fundraising. Um, and they may also have some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, some misinformation that you need to correct, right? So as a staff member, um, you know, if you're the head of fundraising, if you are an executive director, if you're on the development team, consider yourself an educator, right? You know things that they don't know yet, and your job is to help train and get them really confident in being a part of your fundraising efforts. And to that point, everyone could be a good fundraiser, even the people who moan and groan and roll their eyes when you get up to talk about the next fundraising campaign or major event or whatever the initiative is. If we establish from the very beginning, as I said, even before we ask them to join the board, that fundraising is an expected activity, they'll know that it's just par for the course, right? Um, and there's so many different aspects to the fundraising process, our cause selling cycle, that we can find an appropriate role for our board members. So let's say they, say to you, there's no way I can ask someone for money. I wasn't raised like that. It's against everything um, that I believe in, uh, whatever it might be, whatever excuse they come up with about, I will not ask people for money. Fine, let's let them help with identifying potential donors. Or perhaps they'll host an event, but they won't have to make any asks, right? We'll find other board members that can do that or the staff will take it on, right? So there's. Um, lots of different roles, and we it's our job to sort of strategically place people based on their current skill set, their strengths that we observe, and the things they identify that they're most interested in, right? So a lot of this is managing up, establishing ourselves as a mentor, as a trainer, as an educator, as a partner, right? We have to make sure that we're not just saying to them, like, introduce me to some people. We're coming to them and saying, here's the research I've done about your network. I have suggestions I'd like to discuss with you, right? You're kind of modeling and showing them how this, this fundraising thing can come together. And in that case, you're going to break it down into simple, clear tasks. So in my coaching and consulting practice, I've created a few tools that I'll use with boards, right? One of them is like a really fun 10 minute fast and furious brainstorming exercise around their networks. Because oftentimes I hear from my clients, they'll go to their board and they'll say, we need more donors. Who do you know? And their boards are non-responsive. It's like crickets, right? So I teach my clients, one, there's this brainstorming exercise where we use actual prompts about the different social circles they may run in or the different um, professional associations they're a part of to help sort of jog their memory and get them thinking, you know, outside of the box. Um, and then also I train my clients to really leverage tools like LinkedIn to start identifying people that you think as a staff member might be really great prospects for your organization. And that way you can put together a list and put the list in front of your board member and say, let's talk about these people as opposed to starting from a blank slate. Okay, so giving them tasks, 
giving them prompts to respond to is way more effective than just saying, who do you know? Okay. Um, making sure you share how their work is going to fit into that bigger picture to play a role in the, the success of the fundraising campaign or your organization in general is also huge. Um, sometimes it's really obvious to us because we do the work every single day, but you want to connect those dots for your board members. Um, as long as you're doing so in a way that you know sounds really positive and encouraging, they will always appreciate it, right? And repeating to them the work you do today with us on this campaign is going to help fund XYZ initiative, which will have this outcome for the population we serve. Repeating those things over and over isn't just to connect the dots for them, it's also to get them comfortable with the language that they can then turn around and use with your donors or your prospective donors, right? That's teaching them the case, helping them to come up with that elevator pitch if you will, so that when they're at a mixer for their business, something completely unrelated to your cause, and someone says, what do you do in your free time? They can say, oh, I actually serve on the board of this incredible nonprofit, let me tell you about it. And they're prepared, right? They're already walking around being a great ambassador because you've trained them up, you've given them context for the their role in, um, the fundraising efforts and they're just out there spreading the message and bringing back new relationships to you so again we're going to dive a little bit deeper into each of these roles that exist within the fundraising cycle right we've got our prospectors who identify people that are potential donors our cultivators are the ones that once we've said these are great qualified prospects right meaning they have interest personal capacity right there's evidence there that our time spent with them will likely result in a gift a relationship uh, the cultivators help you know get them all warmed up and um, excited about the organization solicitors literally ask for the support so they will ask for the donations and then our stewards are everybody who's involved in saying thank you which again we can't do enough of um, so prospectors, uh, they provide introductions to business contacts, prospective corporate donors, uh, prospective individual donors from their personal networks or the people that they're meeting out in the grocery store because they're now talking about your case so well, right? Um, they help identify names of people who may be interested in participating in the organization beyond just a financial donation, right? This could be additional volunteer leaders. Uh, it could be potential vendors. Um, it could be people who represent foundations who might be able to uh, provide grant funding. And then, of course, we want to make sure that even if there are some folks who are like, oh, I'm not very social, I don't have a big network, if we give them the right tools and the right training and preparation, it shouldn't be a problem that identifying prospects are a requirement for all of our board members. And again, that's something we want to talk about during recruitment, right, right up front. Our cultivators are the folks that will meet with the potential donors. So these are our social butterflies. These are the folks that love to work a room. Uh, they really enjoy going to mixers. Um, they even might, you know, be the folks who are really, um, we've got big personality even on Zoom, right? On screen, you can put them in front of folks and you know that people are going to feel good about the interaction, right? So those are our cultivators. They're also really, excited to talk about the organization, the experience they've had to date, right? Um, the board members will be asked to engage with prospects as a peer and connect the prospect with the organization. So you could have one board member make some introductions to people in their social circle or business um, acquaintances and a completely different board member come in as the cultivator because you've identified a connection beyond just interest in the organization right so there's again special roles depending on people's strengths comforts skill sets at the time when you're doing this work um and frequently we can do this through having our cultivators our board members that are really social and love to chat host a gathering whether it be virtual or in person right so we would again partner with our board member to create an experience in which they get to kind of be that consummate host and we help with the logistics, right? Um, 
planning the program, ensuring people attend, <laughs> getting invitations out, of course, sending out thank yous afterwards with different opportunities to engage again with the organization, come in as a volunteer, um, participate in some upcoming educational opportunity or make a gift if it feels like we're at that point where it feels appropriate and they've expressed interest in doing so, right? So our cultivators really help warm up the relationship. Our solicitors partner with staff again to ask for gifts in an appropriate manner, right? So I have many times over had the experience where I had board members who were really excited to solicit. I know you're like, I wish, I wish that was our problem. Um, but they would usually come from a sales background and live by the old saying, always be closing and jump out ahead of, you know, what I know to be best practices and just ask for money, which can turn people off if it's too early on in the relationship, right? It's almost like proposing before you've been on a third date. So we want to make sure again that we're working with our board about the timing of solicitations. But if we do have those special board members that are really interested in asking for the money, we get them lined up to do so. We give them the training and the support they need to make um, really powerful sort of presentations prior to the ask at meetings. We ask them to place phone calls to follow up, especially if it's a personal contact of theirs that we've been cultivating, having them make follow-up calls to meetings or presentations, um, or you know, a Zoom gathering is really powerful. Asking them to ask their prospect for feedback. What do you think? Who did you engage with? Did you meet anyone interesting? You know, um, do you feel like you have greater clarity on the work we're doing now? Are there any questions you have for me? Right. So engaging your board members um, in that way. Uh, and then of course, personal meetings. So folks who are interested in soliciting, going with them to meet with the donor, whether that be virtually or actually in person, um, to ask for a gift can be one of the most powerful experiences a board member can have. Um, I do wanna say here that if you've got a board of folks who are like, Ugh, fundraising, no, I just no way I could ask for money, find the one who seems like they might be a possibility, who seems kind of interested, who um, is a little bit less tense when you talk about fundraising, make them your best buddy, right? Help them really learn the process and understand it. And after they get their first solicitation under their belt, their, belt, their first ask for a gift that's successful, have them share it out with the rest of the board. That kind of lived experience and the excitement that comes from it is infectious, right? Um, and hopefully that person then becomes a board buddy mentor to a new incoming board member, right? And now we've got this great cycle of training up our boards to be effective fundraisers who are excited about the process. And our stewards, of course, everyone can and should be saying thank you. Um, it's always super helpful if, of course, the staff is um, making it as easy as possible, right? So we want to make sure after a big campaign, so let's say our year-end fundraising push, we give all of our board members a special list of donors with contact information and gift details if possible to reach out and say thank you. A script too is super helpful, especially if you're asking them to make phone calls, right? Email templates, scripts, just make it as easy as possible, as turnkey as possible for them so that the experience is pleasurable and it doesn't feel like one more thing they have to get done and they're likely very busy days, right? Um, and then ask them to report back. Maybe open your next board meeting with, you know, a five minute share out about what they heard or experienced during their, their stewardship calls. That kind of infectious, warm um, feedback can also, you know, just create really good energy. Um, you also want to encourage your board members if they feel so moved to offer to take the donor to lunch or for a coffee or to, you know, a site visit um, to your place of business. Writing handwritten notes, it's old school, but it's lovely still, especially I think since the pandemic and having to go completely online and fully digital, getting a card in the mail is just such a treat, right? It hasn't gone out of style. So um, giving them stationery, 
addresses, stamps, you know, like really preparing your board, lining them up for success, making it as easy as possible is key. Uh, and then of course, if they're getting great feedback from their stewardship efforts and a donor seems really interested in learning more, giving them the power to say, I'd love to arrange a meeting for you to meet with our executive director. You know, the three of us can get together. I'll reach out to the staff and, you know, um, put you in contact to get that scheduled. Empowering them to kind of move the cultivation process forward. And one quick note here, um, creating an advisory board or a leadership council is a really popular term for this lately, can be a great way to um, sort of try out potential board members while getting additional support around fundraising activity and prospecting activity. So identifying business and community leaders uh, with an affinity for your mission, right? So folks that perhaps are already giving at lower levels or they work for a company that's supporting your organization and they've come to volunteer. Um, folks that you know would be willing to champion your cause, to talk about the work you do, make introductions, right? I like to say these folks are friend raisers first, right? Um, it's a beautiful way to create an additional community within your community that can help support, but you're also auditioning folks to become board members in the future. So it's this really cool sort of reciprocal beneficial relationship where the organization's getting, you know, some additional assistance, more introductions, the uh, pool of prospective donors is getting broader, all while you're helping to sort of train up these folks who are potentially interested in the ultimate volunteer leader position, right, as a board member. Um, so some examples of what the role might look like. Again, you would want to create a position description as you would for your board, right? So they would champion your cause. They would provide introductions. They it's a great idea if you say an, a minimum annual financial gift, right? It would be much lower than your board give get, but still something. Um, I have a client called Home Again Los Angeles, and they have this thing called the 365 Club. And so they require that sort of volunteer advisory group to be a part of that. It's $365, $1 a day for the year, right? Um, they support fundraising efforts by attending your events, especially, right, as your key fundraisers. And then, of course, you recognize them beyond saying thank you. You recognize them publicly. Maybe that's some space on your website. Maybe it's something that goes into your annual report that you send out to your full community. Um, perhaps there's opportunities for you to put them in your organization's blog, right? Just make sure there's public recognition there. So uh, they're feeling celebrated for their participation and interested in growing it further. Okay, so... Um, in the chat, share with me a bit. So I just talked at length about the difference between prospectors, cultivators, solicitors, and stewards. I'm interested to know, how do you see your board fitting into these roles? Do you have folks that can fill each of these four types of roles? Is your board maybe heavy on the steward side? What do you think might be possible for your board? Okay, short on cultivators, okay. Heavy on the steward side, definitely. It's a good place to start. Oh, Wayne says his board has more prospectors. That's fantastic. Okay. I love that note, Jess, great. Most of the board fits into solicitors. Wow, Lisa, we're all jealous. Um, Karen says, I have a really young board and I think we're short on all levels, mainly because I don't think I articulated expectations. Karen, that is um, very typical and totally uh, solvable. I don't know if that's the word I want to use, but you can come or you can overcome that, right? Um, it's a process but the sooner you get started, the better, right? Ginger says butts and seats help. <laughs> okay, hopefully there's a, there's a longer question in there, Ginger, for the Q&A portion. 
Um, all board, Helene says, all board members are requested to participate on all the lists. All our board must be professionals and on common ground with core food processing managers. Okay, fantastic. Same situation as Karen. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that feedback. Okay, so if you do have specific questions, perhaps, um, you know, something that's going on right now with your board that you'd like me to dig in further, dig into further in the Q&A, please, now, now is the time to drop in your questions, right? Um, in summary, we want to make sure we have great policies in place, documentation. We've, you know, with intention identified what's going to be a strong board for our organization. We put it into writing. Um, policies are everything. They're a reference point. They keep us on target. And when we find ourselves getting in trouble, it's the best tool to reach back to and say, but this is what we've agreed to already, right? So we wanna make sure we put those board policies into place. We use them in our recruitment process, right? Clear is kind. Um, so we wanna make sure we've got those position descriptions established alongside our board policies from the very beginning. So that when we're recruiting, we can use those tools to make sure that we are asking the right person to take a seat on our board. And if we haven't done that and we need to do a little bit of backtracking, that's okay. You can refer to this seminar. You can refer to board source. Um, there's other great materials at Fundraising Academy's website that you can use as that third party validation. You know, the expert advice you're seeing in the sector to tell your board, these are things that we need to do now, right? This is going to help us be more efficient and effective and to continue building into the future. Remember, there's a role for everyone in fundraising, right? Even if folks can't ask, they certainly can cultivate. They can certainly say thank you. They can certainly make introductions. And then the word I use probably most during um, our 40 minutes together, partnership. It's key to everything, right? If your staff beyond the executive director isn't working with your board, you want to change that, right? We want our board members to feel like they have support and expertise on the staff that they can leverage to engage their community outside of the organization. It's what, it's what, you know, kind of combines those concentric circles and make sure that we've got all of the prospective donors that we need in order to get all the resources that we need to fulfill our mission. I uh, thank you from a board member, especially in a handwritten note is fundraising gold. So let's make sure we're doing that should be a, a regular part of our process. And then creating an advisory group can help you build your future board and create um, opportunity for more prospecting right now. So with that, let's go to questions. We have some good ones too. I, I share some of these questions, so I'm excited to dig into them. So DeAndre is saying, we keep running into candidates who are more interested in furthering their political ambition. We have a lot of congressional staff who want to work for their foundation. What are some res or what are some sources for people who genuinely want to work for community-based nonprofits? So, um, again, what I would want to ask DeAndre is what kind of uh, resources are you sharing with these um, candidates for your board in advance of bringing them onto the board and what's happening in the interview process? Um, I'm a big fan, again, of being direct, clear is kind. And so in that scenario, I would want to say to folks, you know, what are your priorities here? Why do you want to be a part of this organization? Um, what is it about the work we do that makes you want to invest your time, talent, and treasure? Um, hopefully, they're going to be 100% honest with you about what their ambitions really are. Um, but maybe, you know, part of your approach is that you ensure you've got a diverse board in all of the ways. So that would also mean that you wouldn't have a lot of folks doing the same exact thing in their career, right? So congressional staff, fantastic. Maybe you only have 
three of 20 seats available to folks with that background, right? Um, so that's my advice. Uh, look at your board makeup, identify how, what different types of um, professional backgrounds you want to have and how many seats perhaps. And then two, just really direct communication in the recruitment process, interviewing folks to make, to make sure that their intention and their ambition and being of service to your organization is true to your mission as opposed to their career. I love that Claire is kind. I'm, I'm going to steal that. That's great advice. Okay, Cheryl's asking, um, she feels like there's a tension with the board and staff um, that they need or expect what they need and expect from them is difficult to lead up in. Are they my boss? She's the ED or are we theirs? So short, short answer is the board is your boss. Absolutely. As the executive director, you report to them. They evaluate you, they hire, they fire, right? Um, so that is always going to be a point of tension on some level. Um, the question I would want to pose to you is sort of where does the tension lie? Is it that you're not seeing enough activity from the board without you directing them? And if that's the case, you want to really lean into the relationship with your board chair or co-chairs, um, help them understand the challenges that you are feeling, seeing, experiencing with the board, because it's their job to govern the board. You shouldn't be reporting, like let's say you have 12 board members, you don't have 12 bosses that you report to directly. You should be communicating mostly with that board chair and they govern the rest of the body. Um, so yeah, that's the advice I would offer there is that really lean into the relationship with your board chair. And especially if it's, you don't see movement unless you direct them, you've got to get that leadership team, those officers to stand up and take on a more active role. Definitely. Okay, Lisa is asking, all of our board members come in being told expectations, but the follow through is an issue. What is the best way to hold them accountable to what they've agreed to do as a board member? Yeah, I love to use tools for this. Um, I haven't found a, a really elegant way of saying this, but gamifying the experience or kind of playing a little bit is helpful. And what I mean by that is you might have a position description and a really strong onboarding process. Do an accountability checklist at every board meeting, right? So it's, you know, where are you with your give get this year? How many introductions have you made in the last quarter? Um, did you, you know, did you attend these events with a checkbox, right? And requiring everybody to take five minutes to kind of fill out their accountability check sheet to, you know, um, have something for you as the staff to follow up on, you know, thank you so much for filling this out. I've noticed that we're seeing a bit of a gap in your engagement around events, right? But also to help them realize where they are. We all lead busy lives. If somebody's serving on your board of directors, chances are they lead a very busy life. They're probably an ambitious person with like an important role in the community. Um, so it's kind of a good check-in for them as well. And it's something to do as an exercise, right? It's kind of a game at your board meeting that will take a finite amount of time to have a really big impact. Definitely. Okay. Um, Pauletta, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, should we hire a fundraising director? I, I think she probably means like, do you need a fundraising director to really equip your board mm -hmm. or? So I can't answer that question without knowing more about where you are in your organization's evolution. Most uh, start, I call, I say startup nonprofits, organizations that are, you know, budgets under, I'll say $250,000 a year. Um, you probably don't have room for staff yet, right? You might just have an executive director, maybe a part-time admin, and that's okay. You um, can activate a good fundraising board and you kind of have to, right? Because they're a, a working board that's coming um, straight out the gate of the organization's existence, needing to build up resources in order to hire a staff. So you can use these same tools. Um, I always love when board members show up to these 
sessions that I do about engaging your board and fundraising. I obviously do it from the lens of a fundraising professional or a nonprofit developed um, staff member, but board members can do this as a peer, right? You can create tools that you use with your board. Um, you can partner with each other on solicitations. You can develop, you know, um, really great engagement opportunities where one of you is doing the logistics and the other one is doing the program and the engagement and the cultivation piece, right? It's all the same. Uh, so you don't necessarily need a fundraising director. However, if you have ambitious fundraising goals where you're planning to grow your revenue budget, grow your operating budget exponentially in the next three years, you probably want to hire staff, right? Um, think about it this way. I say this to my clients all the time also. A nonprofit organization, um, nonprofit, it's a tax status, right? It's not a business plan. We have to appropriately resource our organizations if we're going to make an impact, right? We live in a world where things cost money. It takes money to make money. Making an investment in professional development staff should have exponential returns to your bottom line. So think of it that way. Think of it as an investment in the organization's future. Okay. Let me see here. Next question. So Nicholas is coming to us from Uganda um, and he's asking about allowances. Um, most says in Uganda, mm -hmm. most of the board members um, expect allowances for what they do. Do you want to talk a little bit about that kind of from an ethics standpoint in the US? Yeah, um, thank you for that question, Nicholas. I can't speak with expertise on expectations in Uganda um, as it comes to NGOs. Uh, but in the US, that's actually not allowed. Um, so corporate boards, yes, people get paid to serve on corporate boards and give their expertise and advice. Nonprofit boards, they are not only not um, permitted to receive payment for their service, but they're also expected to give from their own treasure, right? Um, and fundraise, which is why we're all here today. Um, I do wonder if there might be some good information for you on board source. I would have to look into the specifics around Uganda. And the reason that nonprofit board members in the US can't receive payment is because of the um, IRS status, right? There are certain implications mm -hmm. around being a 501c3 nonprofit if you are a general community based organization. Um, so, Katie, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I think that's spot on. Nicholas, I wish I knew more about Uganda. Um, but I will tell you, I think many global, um, global nonprofits tend to follow the precedent set by the US mm -hmm. at least often. So definitely check out board source. That's my go to for guidelines on stuff like that too. Um, Krista has a great question. So a diverse board is necessary for a successful organization. Yes. However, reaching out directly to BIPOC communities and asking them to volunteer their time can feel like an unfair ask of emotional labor, something that BIPOC communities are already asked way too much. Do you have any tips on DEI recruitment that acknowledges this, but makes the ask anyways? So uh, my most recent staff position was with a place called Home in South Central Los Angeles. Um, the young members, it's a youth development and community center, the young members and the families that we served, 99% uh, of the population was black and Latino. And the board of directors, when I got to a place called home, had 85% white people. Um, so obviously not reflective of the community, right? And the three years that I was there as chief development officer, we did some really intentional effort around board recruitment. The smartest step that I took as uh, the head of development was to insist that I be part of the recruitment process. And here's why my job as the head of development is to be a bridge to all of the stakeholders, right? Donors, board members, 
staff, community members, the parents of the kids that we serve, um, public officials, the media, right? I was a bridge to all those, those people. So that meant that I'm interacting with folks that our board never does. Um, and engaging the staff, the rest of the staff, which was very reflective of the community we served. The list that I came up with, you know, very quickly built a really long list of folks um, from the community who wanted to be in service of the community and were engaging in other ways. They were already volunteering. They were mentors for our youth program. They were coming in with their kids to help pack grocery bags. They were um, attending some of our events, right? So that was a long winded answer to say, um, you can't leave the responsibility of recruiting for DEI if you have a DEI problem on your board with the board. They're going to need the help of the staff members who know the community better. Um, in terms of the emotional labor piece, I, quite frankly, as a white woman, don't have a good response for that. I think that you shouldn't be afraid to ask just because we know that that is a truth because the idea here is that diversifying our boards is heading towards equity, right? And to put people in a position of power who previously have not been allowed to be in those positions of power, that's where we're trying to go. So it might mean that you need to make um, some adjustments to your board policy if it's going to help achieve DEI. For example, I had a client who had a very large give get. $25,000. They wanted to um, hold uh, a certain number of board seats for parents of the children they served in the community. These were people living in poverty. So what did they do? They had discussed at length about doing away with their gift debt policy, but what they um, landed on instead was having donors underwrite, essentially the way it's done sort of university setting where there's the um, endowed chair of the political science department, right? They endowed chairs on the board for community members. It created a new fundraising opportunity for major donors. It ensured that the revenue being generated from the board didn't change, it actually increased. And it ensured that community members, parents of the kids being served were actually having their voices heard all the time and having a real leadership role. So there are ways to go about getting it done. That that's a great example. I love that. I love that. Okay, I skipped. Um, John, I'm sorry, I missed your question earlier. I'm going to throw it up now. So as a board chair, how does one fire non-participative board members appropriately? Um, it's a, good it's a great question, John. Um, be generous in your assumptions about why somebody's not being participative, right? Um, they may have things going on in their life that's okay, right? Like go into the situation non-judgmental, but have a really direct conversation. You know, hopefully you can say, look, when you join the board, you were told that these are the expectations. You're not attending meetings, you're not coming to events, whatever the, the grievances may be. Um, and I wanna give you an opportunity to step down or to find a, a different way that you can be of service, right? So maybe there's a different volunteer opportunity if you have an advisory group, that's always a nice place to roll folks into um, because then you can still tap them for expertise or introductions without them having to, you know, carry the, the full weight of board responsibility. So I would say just be direct, generous, um, empathetic, uh, just because the board term is let's say three years doesn't mean that a bad board member should stay on the board for all that time. Give them a gracious way to exit, right? Things happen all the time in people's personal lives. Um, and sometimes that results in, you know, um, their leadership roles needing to change. Make sure that before you go about sort of firing them, that you have buy-in with, um, you know, your other officers so that you've got a support system and um, yeah, make sure it's make sure it's documented appropriately. 
Okay, so we're one minute after the hour, but I'm, I want to make sure we answer one more question because I, I skipped over it earlier. So Linda is asking, what advice do you have for board members to partner proactively with the ED and his or her staff if the ED isn't making these asks of the board? Okay, I want to make sure I'm understanding that. So the ED isn't sort of engaging the board in fundraising is what I'm reading. Is that what you're getting from that, Katie? I think she's saying if the ED isn't helping the board to fundraise, how can the board work with the staff without like undermining the ED? I, Got hope I, it. That's what I mean, I would have a really direct conversation with the ED about, cause it's likely a bandwidth issue, right? Um, mm -hmm. About, uh, you know, you again, you can use this webinar as an excuse, right? I attended this workshop webinar um, and this woman with 20 years of experience in building successful fundraising uh, programs at different nonprofits was saying that the board has to be engaged in fundraising. I was thinking you've got, you know, some bandwidth it challenges. What about this staff member? Can we partner? Can we work more directly together? Um, you know, your executive director has to run the entire organization. So it's, if there is a development staff beyond the executive director, I highly recommend that they have a ton of contact with the board, right? That's just good practice. And it's also great professional development for them, right? So it's really a mutually beneficial experience. I hope that's all. Okay, and Linda, Linda says thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Linda. Hannah, Thank you so much. Um, we'll make sure we put your contact details in the follow-up email as well. It's always a joy to talk to you. It's always a joy to feature somebody from the Fundraising Academy. Again, we're such big fans. So thank you all for spending your, your Wednesday with us. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, everyone.